my hands, but we're not going to eat these. So <laughs> there you go. It's funny. I'm actually a preschool kindergarten teacher, so I'm an avid, like, hand washer. But right now I just kind of came up. So anyhow, you open up your can of biscuits, and you flatten it out like this. And it's kind of fun because the kids love to do stuff like this all the time. So you flatten it out, put it on a little plate. And you grab a marshmallow. So the marshmallow represents Jesus because how he washed away our sins, and he's, he's white, and he's not white, but you know how it washes his sin away. And what you're going to do is you're going to roll it in sugar and cinnamon and it's kind of funny because i forgot my cinnamon and that's why i ran in there Carol, let me part some. but you're going to do that and so you can tell the children and there's verses here the one that i'm using that you can kind of talk about so the linen it says here um mark 15 46 it'll talk about that and then the the marshmallow um oops hold on one sec I lost it. Okay, for the linen strips, it just says the linen strips. There's no reference. And then the white marshmallow, it says here in Luke 23, 55, you put it in melted butter. And that's when you can reference it to, again, Luke 23, 55, 56. The butter represents the oil Jesus was anointed with. So you kind of talk about that. So you just kind of, it's messy, but it's fun for the kids. Let them kind of just do whatever. So you kind of, it's like all, it's all messed up right there. But, and then you roll it in the sugar and the cinnamon, which is like the spices. And the more, it, it tastes better. So here you go, right there. So then, you know, you get to, you tell them, make sure that you pinch it really tight and you're wrapping up Jesus right now. And if you're working with little ones, of course, make sure it's really pinched. Now, if the marshmallow oozes out, it's totally fine, but, you know, you just want to do it as much as possible. So then what I like to do, because um, I don't want my pan to get all gross, I like dab it one more time in the butter. Let me get the boil ready. I dab it one more time in the butter, because everyone loves butter, right? You put it right there. And if you want to make it really pretty and fancy, you get your extra cinnamon. And you, like, put it on top just a little bit. And let me just show you kind of like that. And inevitably, one will pop, but don't worry. I always tell the kids, it's okay. He's, it's still, he resurrected. <laughs> so... I made some last night. I've been making them at school with my kids. Our kids go to Calvary Chapel. So today I'm going to run over and make them with the fifth graders. But I made them with the third graders a couple days ago. So they look like this. And you go, oh, my gosh, let's open it. <laughs> so, so you just, and there's nothing there. And, of course, the young ones, they're like, oh, my gosh. Like, where did it go? And you're just like, he resurrected. And... Totally, it's the same temperature, everything on here. So it's not anything special. And it's really yummy. I didn't think it was going to be yummy because kid stuff, but it's really yummy. My husband likes them. So if you want to, I'm going to leave this here next to it. Okay. Okay, so our next one for the kids, it's really cute too. Okay, so <laughs> I have three children, and I... Things get busy. So I don't know if you know, but I always get my cupcakes at Smith's because they're a good price, and they're really yummy, and they're fluffy, and they have buttercream and whipped cream. I always get whipped cream because it's fluffier. Oops, and we all love fluffy. <laughs> so they're $7.99 for a dozen. And like this, I wanted it completely plain, and they never sell it like that. So like I call in the morning, and they'll have it ready in the afternoon or the evening. But most of the time, I call the night before if I do a birthday or something. So... And sometimes I'll get them like this for my kids' birthdays, and I'll decorate them. I'll put a big old gumball on them, and it's, it's so cute. And it's, people are like, oh, where'd you get your cupcakes? And I'm like, Smith's for $7.99 a dozen. Put a gumball on it, and it looks fancy. So, okay, here's my, we're going to make, um, if you look in your book, or you don't have to look in your book, but we're going to make um, little lambs. All right. <laughs> so here is my white frosting. And my baby little marshmallows. And 
in my I need one more thing. Oh, my little chocolate. Hold on one sec. Bag of Reese's. So funny, my husband yesterday, I had like all my stuff. He's like, can I eat some of those? I was like, just one. I was like, I have to make stuff. And then plus, I want to make it for the gifts. If you guys, my husband loves chocolate, so I'm like, just one. Okay, so you, it's so simple. Again, it's so simple. And any child can make it, whether they're one or two. And, you know, even if it looks funny, um, at, years ago when I took my teacher training, they said, child made is always best. And it's hard for me because if you're type A and if you, you're like, no, I want to make it perfect. Can I cut that for you? <laughs> and so my preschool professor was like, oh, make sure you never cut things for your students. And I was like, oh, okay. And so you would have to you know, hold it for them. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. But it's so true because when they make it, it looks, it's so funny, but it looks so good. Okay. So you unwrap a little Reese's and you pop him. You know, you guys are over there. You pop him right here. This is your head. So it's simple. Then I use cornstarch. And I'm just going to put a little bit right on here because I'm going to glow on my eyes. Oh, corn, corn syrup, not cornstarch. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be gross. And my little, you know, it's crazy. I haven't found my little, my little eyes, which was so weird. I'm going to get them from here. Oh, sorry. My eyes. I found it. Okay. So here are my eyes. You can get these at Michael's. Everything here, I, you know, I go everywhere. I go to Michael's. I go to the 99 cent store. I go, like, Walmart. You go everywhere, you know, just to find your deals. And so there's that. Get a little toothpick. My little cornstarch just a little. So I was a Montessori teacher. As you can see, I have like all little gadgets and things. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you put one eye. And when I made one last night, it's cool because I thought, oh man, what if the cornstarch does something funny to the chocolate, but it doesn't. It looks good. Corn syrup. Corn syrup. My kids always say that to me, mom. Okay, so then you just start at the, at the head. You just put them right on. And it's so simple. Mini marshmallows. Mm -hmm. So this one, okay, and so the one I made last night, I'm not going to make this one as fluffy because I know we're kind of pressed for time. But the one I made yesterday, I made it really fluffy. So, of course, or the more the marshmallows, the merrier. And my kids, like, really like marshmallows. I'm like, it's, I never liked marshmallows as a kid, but they love them. So these are your little lambs. And then it's a good conversation starter because, you know, you're always talking to your kids about something, right? So you say, well, Jesus was the lion and the lamb. And I saw in another Pinterest thing, you can make lion cupcakes, but I couldn't get that fancy. So I was like, but you can do both. But I thought it's so cute. And... You talk about, oh, why is he the lamb? And then you start talking about things, and, and they have fun making them, and it's really, and it's simple. You don't have to get too messy, and if you're running out of time or doing something. So there's one more thing I did, um, but I'm not going to do a demo for it. Kendall help me with this. But here's, so here's a cabbage, plain, simple. And with this cabbage, you can do, oh, you keep letting me breathe. You guys are over there. So, um, and then Miss Sam Lewis was helping me to this morning. She goes, but purple, because the green cabbage when I went to the supermarket wasn't as um, frilly, like if you go to Whole Foods or Sprouts. And so I got purple instead. But Sam goes, oh, like Jesus, like cloth clothes in purple. And I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> so I wanted to share that. So, you know, that's another thing. But the cabbage, you, you know, and if you peel the leaves this way a little bit, too, oh, like in your picture, it, you can do that too. And inside, I wanted to just, just tell you, it's a plain, simple cup. 
It's a cup actually I borrowed from church. And you can use a mason glass. You can also use the floral sponge, but I wasn't able to get that. So you, I just like cut it out, popped it in. And then um, another good thing is the cabbage that you scoop out, you can make salad or slaw. So you, you know, you recycle, you can use everything. Okay. So, and you just stick them all in. It's really simple. Actually, your kids could probably help you do that too. Okay, so there's that. So, oh, I had one more thing to talk about. Um, this is kind of like my kids' table I did. We've always colored eggs in my family. And um, nowadays, it comes with like a piece of wax, but you can always use crayons. And we would always draw things on there. And as I, you know, when I got saved, I, I remember I still want to color eggs. And then I saw this site too, like, he is greater than I, we put on there. And we put little crosses and Jesus. So, you know, um, I, you hear all the time, you know, the world takes away our holidays, our moments, but, you know, you just take them back. And so you just decorate. And then this one, my husband did this one, I love God. He's helping me. So, you know, and, and some of them, you don't have to write anything, just be plain and simple. And the one I saw on Pinterest had muted colors, so that was really pretty too. And look at cross and heart and happy face. And this for my table for the kids, so anyone who knows me knows I love these gumball. I have them at all the kids' parties. I always just have them to decorate. Uh, it's just fun little things to put on the table. It brings out color, and it's cost-effective too. And <laughs> they never go bad, so, which is kind of sad because I'm like, I've had it, some I've had for like years, and I'm like, oh, that's not right. But anyway, I keep it and I use it. And but I'm not the type to. I mean, I'm known as the candy lady at school. Like they're like Mrs. Lee. I'm like, do you want candy? So you know. But anyways, I so you can decorate it very simple. I mean, of course, you know you can find deals anywhere. I was just talking to somebody and I said, oh, I was talking to Cindy. And at Home Goods, if you go and you fear or Marshalls, Ross, any of those places, like even like this moss, I found it on clearance. Of course, when you need it, it's never. So what I do is I stock up, and then I become a hoarder, which I'm trying not to do. So that's my next thing. But OK, so I have one more thing for you guys. All right, let me move all this. I'm going to do a resurrection garden. And I'm sure some of you have seen that. Let's see. All right. So for a resurrection garden, it's kind of more for the adult table. You can do it for the kids' table too, but um, it's a real, some people do it with small children. Some people just do it on their own, kind of like um, the Japanese gardening. I think it's kind of calming and soothing. So you first take a terracotta tray. Sorry, I keep disappearing. Huh? <laughs> okay. I could not find a plastic one because I heard plastic doesn't scratch your table. So I wanted to find a plastic one, but I went to three places and they do not have plastic. And plus I think plastic would have been more affordable. But this was $5 at Walmart, so not too bad. But it, like I said again, if you don't want to scratch your table, but put something under it, then it'll be okay. Okay, so I would probably do this outside. Um, but since we're inside, I'm going to put a little thing down so we don't get it all messy. And a lot of the things that we use for this, too, you can find in your backyard. My kids love rocks. Miss Michelle knows. She helps the collection. And my kids carry rocks in their bags. And I'm like, why are you carrying rocks in your bag? I'm like, so heavy. But they love rocks, and they collect all the rocks in my backyard. So I took some of their collection. <laughs> but, okay, so you get... A plate like this and then you have soil and this so the huge bag at Walmart was two dollars and then the little bag was five dollars so I had to buy the huge bag and so I was like well I'll be making a lot of these <laughs> we'll make them for my family but so you get the soil like this and you put it on top Not too much to fill it, but just enough to kind of get it spread out evenly. And I, was, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to add a little water because I want it to have a little texture. 
so it doesn't move around too much. Okay, so you got your soil there, then you get your little tiny terracotta plant pot. You know, this again was like under a dollar, and you put it right here, and this represents the tomb. After you do that, you add more soil. You kind of want to bury it. You know, you know, little kids are going to love this. Oh, my gosh. Dirt. Okay. Okay. So here's your tomb. Here's your kind of like, it's like your hill. And you get your moss. I price checked, and Michael's has the fluffier stuff, but it's a little bit more. And Walmart, it's not as fluffy, but it's much more cost effective so then you want to cover it with your moss people were also using um gosh what's it called it's that that uh grass that grows super fast <laughs> so funny now I'm thinking of the commercial. But no, it's um, something else, wheatgrass or something. And they said it's kind of cool if you do that because then you get to watch it grow. But some people are like, no, I just want it kind of instant. So then they get the moss instead. So you just spread it out. So basically we're making a little mini tomb resurrection garden area. Okay, so I'll add a little more after. So you do that, then you get your rock, your pebbles, your rocks. So again, these are like from my backyard. Of course, you can get the fancy shiny ones too, but you know, you can just get them from your backyard. And for this one I'm doing, I just make a little pathway. So you just set it everywhere on the side or a little pathway along the line. Okay, so there's my path. Here's my, uh, I read another thing that said you could put succulents. You can cut those out. Let me get my scissors. Because succulents kind of like, you can't kill them, right? <laughs> like, okay. So you can kind of put one here to look like a real plant. I take this one out. just a few you can fill it up if you want this is also from my backyard <laughs> um, so funny there's just a huge rock pile there and you, this is the stone and then this is, oh no one of my crosses broke oh, but this is the stems from my greenery here because um, we live in a new development and we don't have a lot of trees so I couldn't really find them but this one kind of broke but I put three so one, two, and then that would be three right there. But so just like this. Yeah, it's really cute. Thank you. Um, I hope some of these gave you ideas. And of course, you know what? I always say, um, I love just tweaking ideas. You see something, you make it your own. So I hope this helped you, and come talk to me if you need anything. Okay, thank you. Well, this all started uh, several years ago when I worked at the school, and uh, our vice principal, Jack Wazowski, would always talk about some of the traditions they had in the Polish community, because he is Polish. 
and I think, I believe he's from Buffalo, New York. And so he talked about these butter lambs, and he would talk about how they were really popular at Easter time, and um, I guess the nuns would uh, make them and sell them. And so he always talked about butter lambs, butter lambs, and we always said, oh, we should make them with the kids. And while I was there, we never did make them. I believe Randy Say actually made them with the kids, but... Um, Kendall asked me if I would make the butter lambs for all of you, and I'm thinking, oh, how am I going to make a butter lamb? I've never made a butter lamb. So I jumped on YouTube, and I thought, I'm going to look at one of their tutorials. I happened to find one that's called Easter Butter Lamb, and I don't know that I'm pronouncing the Polish name right, but it looks to me like if I looked at it, it said Baranek, and there's a part one, two, and three. And so I looked at a lot of the different YouTubes, and this one happened to be my favorite one. And there were two ladies. One was probably my age, and one was probably like her aunt. She's, I believe she probably was in maybe in her 80s. And so she helped her make that. So there were two of them to make, and it was a really cute video. So that was my inspiration for um, this little lamb that I made was off of that um, YouTube video. And I just thought he was cute because he was fluffy. And... Um, there's nothing cuter than a little fluffy lamb. So uh, what I did was, um, as I watched the video, I, you can make these lambs any size. You can do a smaller one like this, like a small table size, if there's just a few of you there, or you can make a couple of them, or you can make them larger. They actually have molds for these lambs um, that you can get butter molds. You could probably, if you had a small um, lamb cake mold, you could probably use that mold also. But this... This one was a free form, and I am not artistic. My mom and my sister are much more artistic than I am, but so I'm not very artistic. So I don't just see things. I, I um, in my mind, you know, I don't have that gift. Some of you have that gift, though. You can see a finished product. You can see the steps of how to make it. I don't do that. I have to look at a video. <laughs> so um, I want to really quickly tell you just a couple things. Uh, I'm going to put gloves on. Butter happens to be. Uh, one of the easiest things that I have found just making this butter lamb was very easy to work with and um, actually much easier than working with clay or something like that. Leona could probably tell you that. Um, <laughs> um, so as I watched this, I had a couple things. I had a little mini spatula that I had from, uh, I believe, a cake decorating class. Susan, did you take that? You didn't take it. When we lived in Arizona, there was a, one of our homeschool moms that was a cake decorator. So she did a little class for us, and we had to get certain supplies. And so I, I've had this thing probably 20 years. And um, so the, the thing that I used was this little spatula and a little paring knife. Those I found to be the easiest things to work with. I know the lady on the video used a paring knife. I also um, used a little um, skewer. Those wooden skewers, I guess you could probably use, um, if you ever go out for Chinese food and you get chopsticks, don't throw them away because they're always a good tool for something. So a um, little skewer and then um, a toothpick. A um, couple of the supplies I needed, of course, was butter. I tend to use organic butter, and if I'm going to eat it, then um, that's what I use. Butter is not really cheap. I think I bought this organic butter for $4.49 for a pound, which is actually pretty good at Smith's. Um, you can also, there's various places you can go to Sprouts, wherever. You can just buy regular butter if you prefer that. But butter's not cheap. I think even a pound of butter, of just conventional butter, is probably close to $4. So if you find a place to find it inexpensively, it's great. Makes a nice gift. The other thing that I... Um, used for part of the decor was um, the uh, peppercorns for the eyes and then the cracked peppercorn. It's, I just happen to have them already. You could use whatever you like. If you have cloves, use cloves. Anyways, I had the, the cracked peppercorn and so I used that for its little nose to kind of give it a little face on it. So um, anyway, so I'm going to start off here. I... Uh, I put two of the softened butter together. As long as it's not melty, if it's soft, that's about where you want it. And I probably cut a third of it. To make a, a lamb that size, I used two sticks of the butter. And then put them right on the top. And kind of 
push them in just a little bit. The great thing about it is you're like, okay, how is that going to hold together? It's amazing. When you start um, removing parts of the, um, of the lamb, you use it as your, your glue to start putting it together. And so you kind of cut a little away to start making your lamb take a little bit of shape. Some of it you won't use, so you just want to put it back on your little um, paper that your your wax paper that your uh, lamb is wrapped in. Um, I'm gonna. I would do this. I can't do it. Make the face on that side. So I'm going to just work around it a little. And if you'll just bear with me on this. So what I started doing was kind of started shaping the body a little, and then <clears throat> to give it a little bit of shape, oh. to give it a little bit of shape, and the great thing about, um, I put it on a paper plate with plastic wrap, so I would be able to move it around and use it, so then I just started cutting away at it, and just trying to make the shape of the lamb, cutting away for the head. And again, you're going to cut away quite a bit of this, but you won't waste any because you're going to make fur with the extra butter out of a ricer. And this was the ricer that Kendall loaned me. Some of you have. Did anybody use one of these when you were growing up? Your, maybe your mom or your grandma used a ricer. Anybody? Okay. Well, um, I didn't have one. I don't remember my mom or my grandma using one. But um, so I asked. I remember, Susan, I think your mom had one. I remember that. And um, Kendall loaned me her, so thankfully she had one. And I think she got this pretty inexpensively, about 6 or $7 uh, for one of those. So they are great for your potatoes or um, anything that you want to have a really fine um, appearance. Uh, or texture. So anyways, start gluing this guy together. Start molding him and shaping him together. And the head is probably the thing that will take you the longest. Everything else is pretty quick. And you're probably thinking, oh, that's going to take a long time. But it really doesn't once you start shaping it. I did um, make little legs on mine. You don't have to make legs. Um, I did it because I just thought I didn't want him to look like a poodle. <laughs> and I asked a couple of people's opinion did, if they thought it was okay because I didn't want it to uh, resemble a dog. So uh, moving right along here, uh, one thing about um, a little lamb. So as you see, I, I started cutting into the neck to start making like a little neck. And then as this butter softens a little bit more, you can shape it, get his head a little rounder. This is not going to be as good as when I actually was sitting down and I could really um, be more at eye level making him. But um, So you get the concept of you just start cutting away and start uh, molding the butter into the shape that you like. I should have probably had Leona do this because she is an artist. She probably would have been way quicker. And I'm sure some of you that are really um, apt at doing, you know, uh, artwork, this would be very easy for you. And like I said, I'm not an artsy person, but um, I was able to do it. And I know if I'm able to do it, you would be able to do it. So start, start shaping it. And then what I did was um, the, the little ears I put on him might be a little bit thick. Um, Kendall put several different pictures, so there's different designs for making your little lamb. Um, one of the things that I did when I, as I was listening to some of the tutorials, was the lamb representing the lamb of God. And so it's a great starter conversation point for your table 
when you are having your Easter meal, whether you have believing family members or not believing family members, it's a great thing to be able to, uh, when they start, if anybody talks about your little lamb sitting on the table with your your meal that you lovingly prepared, um, it's a great springboard to have that conversation about the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. And it seems like Easter time people are a little bit more willing to hear uh, about uh, the resurrection, about Jesus, about him being the Lamb of God who, t- who does take away the sins of the world. Um, one of the things that I learned was you can shape your little ear for your lamb right on your um, paring knife. So it kind of gets it right about the size that you want, and it's very easy to place. So just do it and place it right on your ear and just kind of smooth it right over there. I'm going to finish here really quickly. Um, Smooth it right on there. And again, just take it and shape it right on there. The butter is very forgiving. Like frosting is very forgiving. Butter is actually very forgiving. And you can just reshape it if you need to. So... I'm thinking this is probably about the same size as the other one. I'm almost done. And then I'm going to show you how the fur goes on uh, through the ricer. So um, he's starting to take a little shape there. And you just continue working with him. Oops, I kind of smashed the other ear down. So see, comes right back up. Okay, so I took a couple pats of butter. Just stuck it inside there. And the great thing about this ricer is as you look, you can see you can make the fur for the lamb's wool as as long as you like. Um, I used a toothpick. Um, Some of the molding and shaping I actually did with this when I did it um, to get it a little smoother as I was making the face. But this is great because... You just take your little um, toothpick and take take it right off of there, and then you can lay it right on the fur, right on the shape of your lamb, the body of the lamb, and just lay it right on there. It's very easy. Um, and so you just continue to take it around. So you can get as detailed as you like. Um, use up all the the butter, and you'll use up most of the butter just doing it. So that's that's that portion. I won't go much longer than that. So you can already see how the fur, the wool on the lamb. And then again, you would use your, to make your face, and you would use, you could use your little um, tip of your skewer and just make your little holes for the eyes. This face is not the greatest because I'm like I said I'm just doing a quickie on this and you can um, do the mouth you would um, take your little peppercorn I've had these peppercorns forever by the way I decided grinding them was not worth the time so but I kept them for something I don't know I guess it was just for this so Uh, Put the little eye in there. And again, if you have whole cloves, just use your whole clove. And so the little eyes are in there. And then you would take the cracked peppercorn. The thing with the cracked peppercorn is you want to make sure that they're all various sizes. You want to just get two that are really close in size so they look more like um, this little lamb. So that's him. And... um, You put the little parsley around him. I actually put a little parsley in his mouth like the picture that Kendall made. And so you can, this is a great gift. Also, if you want to do something nice for your neighbor at Easter, you could just make a few of these, give them to your next door neighbor. It's a great, like I said, little witnessing tool. Put a little scripture card on there. Um, In Polish tradition, they put a red ribbon around it, and that was to represent that... um, how the blood of the lamb is what takes away the sin of the world. So um, Jesus, 
takes away the sin of the world. And then they would put like a little flag on it. I didn't do that, but those were some of the traditional things that were done. So anyways, I hope that you will take the time to make a little lamb. Next time you see butter at the store, you can remember how creative you can be with it and to bless others with it. So thank you. Morning, ladies. I do want to point out that that's actually Brenda's butter lamb right there. We, she sent us a picture and asked if we thought it looked like a, a poodle. <laughs> it doesn't. It looks just like a lamb, doesn't it? So that's hers. Well, I'm excited to be here this morning. It's our fifth and last uh, Refreshing Connect of the season. And I know I have loved them. I've loved this added part of our Bible study. So thank you, Amber, for doing that for us. Um, so it's been a while since we last spoke. Um, I'm no longer a redhead. Um, but we did start the season back uh, last year with the season of grace, seasons of grace. And we looked in scripture at the lives of, can, is this working right? Um, at Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And we set out to define grace and considered that sometimes we may not recognize that we're receiving God's grace when we're in the moment when we think we should be doing something else or getting something else. Uh, but when we trust that God knows what he's doing and has a plan for us, we can more easily see his grace poured out on his life, on, on our lives. And we found um, in that study that Ruth married Boaz, that's going to be important, and became the mother of Obed, the grandfather of David, and Naomi, her mother-in-law, who had said, call me Mara, remember that? Because she thought she was in a season of bitterness, um, was in fact being blessed beyond measure. Um, have you recognized God's grace a little better since that time? And have you been able to remind yourself that um, there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more, and more importantly, there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. And so um, the next we looked at the season of Thanksgiving, and we looked at personal relationships and messy family dynamics. And so Glennis shared with us to consider Joseph, whose brothers had thrown him into a pit, and when he could have exacted his revenge. Instead, he showed godly love to his brothers. And um, she shared how we can show that same kindness and forgiveness by putting love in action when we set aside our pride and we submit to the Holy Spirit. We want to have more than that one day truce in the battle. Remember, she shared they played soccer and shared cigarettes in the, in the World War I battle. Um, but we want more than that more than just that one day at the holidays. Instead, we want to build relationships with a humble heart and prayer and love. And then in January, we rang in the new year with Carolyn, and it just touches my heart just thinking about it. When she shared with us uh, that personal story of her relationship with her parents and that she had, her topic was seasons of mercy, right, at the new year. It's appropriate to look at that. And she shared from Psalm 103, but I just remember being so, re so moved when she reminded us that to reach out with the arms of Jesus, we need to empty our own hands. We need to let go of what we were holding on to, and that in doing so and reaching out to others, we could see Jesus in that surrender. Remember when she did this for us? And that's how we want to be with our family, right? And when Carolyn purposed to show mercy um, as he showed her every day, even though it wasn't shown to her in her home, God blessed her beyond what she thought was possible. And so then we had the season of love, and Susan Shaw pointed out how much we were loved by God. And you remember the list, and we all wanted her to repeat it for us. And I, I don't have it in order, but I think it's um, God loves us. Um, these are the words that we find. Blessed, chosen, pursued, defended, forgiven, accepted, free, valuable, irreplaceable, redeemed, secure, priceless, victorious, and cherished. And she also touched our hearts with that letter from her son to his father. And I know that um, since then, I've desired to be a more reliable and accepting um, mother and friend 
um, based on that. Um, so that was just so wonderful. So today, we're going to touch on hope in this greatest season of hope. So let's pray. Our Father, bless our time together, Lord, and speak to us through your word. Open our hearts to receive the word you have for each of us. We thank you for the fellowship time that we've shared, for the butter lambs and the tablescapes, and for the time uh, to worship you this morning, Lord. Keep us from distractions and fill us with your hope. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, will you turn to Joshua? Today we're going to look, take a look back at Rahab. And I know we've done this in our study, so Rahab is familiar to, to you. Um, she's in, initially introduced to us as a harlot named Rahab. So we kind of set the stage, right, in Jericho. It's Joshua 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 18, so you can follow along. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for, they, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the, with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. As soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver us from death. So the men answered her, our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly with and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall, and she said to them, Get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, We will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord, in the window through which you let us down, and unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. So we are familiar with that passage, right? Now let's just look at just a few things. First of all, Jericho was a walled city. It had seemed to its inhabitants to be secure. Maybe because of that, it had become a city of pleasures, sex and false religions, not expecting to be overtaken. But when the threat arrived, they had no courage in their walls, and they were unprepared to defend themselves beyond the existence of their walls. We live in a city much like this. Las Vegas is focused on pleasure and sex and the false gods of money, entertainment, and what happens here stays here. But we too seem to be ill-prepared to defend ourselves. Another thing to consider is that although Rahab was a harlot, she lived and worked in the same town as her own family. And it seems that she had an ongoing relationship with them. That seems a little strange to us, right? But her behavior, at least to an extent, was thought of as almost normal in that community of they were Canaanites, and there was perversion, and they worshipped that. Um, it sounds a little bit like, like Las Vegas again, doesn't it? Um, here our billboards shout the same thing. 
don't they? So I once wrote a complaint about a billboard. It was a terrible billboard. I'm not going to tell you what it says, but it was terrible, and it was by the airport. Now, if it was on Las Vegas Boulevard, I probably wouldn't have seen it, first of all, but I also wouldn't have complained. But it was on the way to the airport. So I wrote a letter to the county and to the county commissioners, and um, they didn't respond. The billboard didn't last much longer, but I saw the county spokesperson on the news about three months later, and he was saying that they had gotten a new complaint about a different billboard, but they had only received one complaint in an entire year, and I, I just couldn't believe it. My complaint was the only complaint they had received in an entire year. Have you driven down our streets and seen those billboards? So very much kind of the same thing, the same sort of things are being worshipped. I mean, we don't shout them or put them, you know, in 20 feet letters unless we're proud of them, right? And so as a community, we sort of share those same things with Jericho. Well, if you recall, it was about five years ago when Pastor John shared throughout all of Resurrection Week how the Old Testament scriptures um, foretold and reflected our Savior as the Passover lamb. Do you remember that? And um, he talked about how the Passover lamb had to be inspected and was, had to be spotless. And so those are the same things that Jesus went through, right? Um, his blood marked us for salvation from death in the same way the blood on the doorposts allowed death to pass over in the, household, in the households of the Israelites in Egypt. And there's many additional parallels, um, just even the up and the other things that were named, and, and that this was to take place at twilight, and just so many similarities. And in that, in, the, in that our Bible, from the very beginning to the very end, proclaims the same good news, this is where our hope comes from, right? Um, in Genesis, we see Jesus foreshadowed also in, um, and I was going to, uh, use the word typology, and I was practicing sounding like Pastor John when he says that, and I thought, well, I didn't ask him permission, so I won't try to imitate him. <laughs> but, um, but Abraham first had the promise of God that his descendants would number more than the stars and that the promise would come through Isaac. And so when Abraham then took Isaac um, to, he was told to take Isaac to sacrifice his son, um, there came a point when they stopped on their journey, and Abraham told the servants to wait, and he loaded the very wood that he would use for making the altar onto Isaac's back. You remember we looked at, at that in our studies. Um, can you just see the picture of that, that Isaac has that wood on his back, um, to, carrying it to the place where he would be sacrificed? And when Isaac realized that they had no, um, no sacrifice with them, and he was being prepared by his father, his father reassured him and told him that God will provide the lamb for himself, right? Um, Abraham's hope was in God. Even as he was doing that, he was hoping in God. He had the promise and he held on to it. Um, Rahab is yet another demonstration of what God would do through Jesus Christ for us. Rahab was a sinful woman. She had a past. She was living an impure life in a doomed city. And, um, and my husband pointed this out when he, he was reading through this with me, and he said, she had no hope. Look at what her life was like. There was no love in her life. She wouldn't have had re real relationships with people. Even, even if we don't have the book to tell us what sin is, don't we know what sin is? We just, we know that. And she would have just been living a life with no hope. And so... Um, but yet living on the wall and considering her profession, which meant she would meet lots of travelers from far and wide, um, she had heard of the great victories of the Israelites and about their God. And she says in verse 11, for the Lord your God, he is God. Isn't that just so exciting? Um, she had heard and she believed. Rahab then chose to help God's people at great risk to herself, right? She, she wasn't just telling some spokesperson she didn't know where the spies were. She was responding to the king of Jericho that she didn't know where the spies were. So not only was she um, not telling the truth, but she was not telling the truth to the king. Um, where, um, and in this, 
in doing this, in doing this for the spies and making that decision, having heard about their God, she was glimpsing hope, wasn't she? Probably for the first time in such a long time, um, where before she had no hope. But in that moment of recognition of what would happen to her family, she found hope in the true God of heaven, um, and that hope was represented by that scarlet rope outside of her window, wasn't it? Um, it's a similar picture to the blood on the doorpost. Just picture that, that scarlet rope out of the window. Um, and I don't think that they tell us the color just, just because. I mean, they tell us that because we're to see that, that similarity. We're to see that picture. Um, it is when we look to him that we can grab hold of the scarlet thread, which is salvation from destruction, and embrace hope. He is our hope just as she saw in their God her only possibility of hope. Have you ever heard someone say, I don't dare hope, or I don't want to get my hopes up? I have felt that way, but, it, but isn't it foolish to say those kinds of things? Because hope is never our enemy, is it? We get our hopes, people say, well, I don't want to get my hopes up because they'll be dashed. But what, do, what does hope do? It sustains us until we get the answer. Right? So why not? Why not hope? Hope is never our enemy because when, even when what we hope for is not realized, even if it doesn't come in, what happens? Either a new hope is born or God gives us his peace. I've taken two bar exams in my life, and that has nothing to do with alcohol. They're multi-day tests on the law um, in two different states. The first was in July 1988. Uh, the whole country takes the bar exam on the same day, either in July or in February. Those are the only days that they give the bar exam. The, the reason they do that is because part of the test is a multi-state test. And they don't want anybody to have a um, heads up or an advantage. So everybody has to get it on the exact same day. But then you have to wait for three months to get your results. So in my three months, I went to Hawaii. I was a poor student, and I stayed with my cousins who were poor college students, but I was in Hawaii, woohoo! And um, in October, the word finally arrived. So nowadays, they still have to wait three months, but they get their results that, they're told what day, and they get to go online, and it's instant. And the sites never crash, because they're prepared. Um, but back in the old days, um, we had to sit out by the mailbox in a lawn chair and wait for the mailman so that we could get that, that letter. And um, for three months, I would hope, intermittently with, and this is absolutely true, I would have dreams that I missed every single question. Um, hope would spring, and then it would spring a leak. And hope does that. It wells up, and then hope dries up. But hope is that great possibility that all will be all right, right? Um, it's what gets you through the wait. All you can do is wait. As we used to say back then, I, I had good news. I got the two fat envelopes. So all was well, the, and the mailman made it out alive. Um, sometimes we hope for health or recovery or, or for a, a prodigal child. And sometimes the answer is no. But hope is what sustains us until the peace of God replaces it. I know I've written that in here three times. I, I kind of marked that for myself that I wrote that in there three times. And my message is a little long, and I probably should have taken some of this out. But that just seems so important to me. Why should we let go of hope? It gets us through, and then God gives us the answer that he's chosen for us. And if the answer is no, doesn't the word promise us he gives us his peace to get through that? Um, you know, a submarine, in a submarine, you can't use a red pen. Um, because the lights inside the submarine are red, red ink disappears. So submarines use red lights because apparently it's easier for our eyes to adjust from red light, which we can see in, to complete darkness, which we can't see in. Um, and so it, the lights can go back and forth and our eyes can adjust easily. If they were white lights, we wouldn't be able to adjust like that. But I once went to a, a message and the speaker wrote in this huge fat red uh, marker, on a white sheet of paper, sins. She wrote hate and uh, lying and stealing and uh, promiscuous sex and 
false witness. So she wrote all these words on this white sheet and then took a red transparency and folded it over and all those words disappeared. And that's a representation to us of what happens with the blood of Christ, right? All of our sins just disappear because of him, because of his, his blood. God chose to save Rahab from her past. He chose to pass over her section of the wall while all the other walls of Jericho were brought to rubble. He wiped away her past. He chose to allow her to escape, and she was brought outside the camp of the Israelites with her family. Rahab asked with hope that not only she but her entire family would be saved, and the God of hope met her there. He is the same God who allowed his son to be that sacrifice for us that our sins might disappear. His blood is shed for us that we have hope. Um, when Daniel was met with the law forbidding the praying to any other god but the king or else be thrown to the lions, he went home, opened the windows, and prayed aloud. I just love that picture. When someone says you can't, do we try to figure out, well, do we have enough money? Do we have enough help? When we could just go home and throw open the windows and do exactly what he purposed for us to do. Um, he trusted, he believed in the true God, the God of hope, and he trusted in the hope of his deliverer. In an interesting twist, King Darius, who reluctantly put Daniel in that lion's desk, also hoped in the true and living God of Daniel. Um, when the next morning King Darius called out, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Even King Darius had hope in our God. Um, Rahab had a past. She was clearly a sinner. It was her identity. Even in a world much like our present day where sin is acceptable, her name was the reference to her sin. Rahab could not save herself. That's an important part of this. Um, we, have to, we have to recognize that we are helpless in this situation to get ourselves out of the situation. And where we need to look is to the empty tomb. It's foreshadowed from the beginning, our God of hope, our Savior, but he's found in that empty tomb. That's why I love this, this decoration so much. Um, Jesus Christ, promised by God from the beginning, he walked in the garden, he is the Passover lamb. God asked Abraham if a father would sacrifice his son. God did that for us. Our father provided the lamb as the offering for himself. He saved a lost woman and her family who placed a scarlet rope out her window. Jesus, whose birth was foretold to be in Bethlehem, his ministry from Galilee, who was born in the lowliest place. Jesus, who took the wood on his own back to carry to provide himself as a sacrifice, who did not condemn a, condemn a harlot, but went to the cross for each of us, innocent and perfect. Oh my goodness, I just love this. Um, he is our hope. He is our hope, isn't he? Um, I, I'm hoping that this is not a downer to you because to me it's just so exciting. I just want to cheer. Uh, scripture says, he also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock and established my steps. And I've been in that pit before, and I know most of us have been in that pit. And we can try for ourselves to get out, and what happens? Miry clay means all that stuff comes back on us. It's, we're not going to be able to get a foothold, are we? It's just going to keep sinking down on us. And so what's the only way out? And here's the scripture for it. Um, the only way out is to lift up our arms and to let God pluck us out of it. Um, whatever your problem is, whatever pit you're in, you can stop fighting or fixing and lift up your arms and call to God our hope of rescue to set our feet on the rock. This is a book filled with hope. Um, there are thousands of promises, and I tried to find how many, but there's so many different ideas on how many promises there are. Some said over 3,000, some said over 5,000, um, but this is a book full of promises. There's a great book called God's Promises, and you can buy it, or you can open up this, and you can find God's promises there. You can read about the woman at the well. You can read about the woman with the issue of blood. You can read about Elizabeth, who thought she was barren, but God... You know, how many times do we get excited when we see that phrase, but God. But ladies, people are hurting in our world. And we're approaching a holiday where we get to invite them into our home. We get to invite them here. We get to have those cards that Amber held up. And we definitely, we want to do that. 
People are broken all around us. But God puts people's lives back together. We need to let him. We need to let him be the potter, the healer, the lifter of our heads, the Lord of our life. He closes the mouths of iron of lions. He lifts us from the pit. He rescues us even from total destruction. Um, and he does it today, not just thousands of years ago. But he does it right now because he's alive. He's risen. The tomb is empty. Amen. Amen. Um, in Psalm 51, David cries out asking God to wash him thoroughly. No detergent would clean him. He was not able to get away from the guilt of Uriah. He felt unclean like a leper. He was unclean, unable to wash it away. What was today's through the word? Talked about Jesus being white as snow, right? That's how he can clean us. Is there something or some sin or some past behavior that is following you? Ask for his cleansing. Um, let me see. Okay, Corey Ten Boom, you know who she is? She lived through the Holocaust, said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. About hope, St. Thomas Aquinas said, faith it has to do with things that are not seen, hope with things that are not at hand. But my favorite is from Billy Graham, and it doesn't have the word of hope in it at all, but it's clearly all about hope. He said, I've read the last page of the Bible. It's all going to turn out all right. <laughs> I just want to return to Rahab for one more moment. Not only did God save Rahab from the destruction of Jericho, but in Ruth 4, 20 to 21, uh, which is where we started back in talking about grace, um, it tells us that Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. Matthew 1, verse 5 provides additional insight. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. So Rahab was the mother-in-law of Ruth. And isn't that where we started talking about the other mother-in-law of Ruth. Um, she may well have, uh, Rahab may well have been one of the townspeople who came out to greet Naomi when she, along with Ruth, returned to Moab. Remember who she says, call me Maratu. And these two women, Ruth and Rahab, as we've studied, um, are two of the of only four women named in scripture in the lineage of the king. Um, finally, Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. I got this little card, this little um, adorable lamb, and it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we may, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Um, so let's pray. Oh Lord, we live in a world full of hurting people. Yet we know hope in you is like water in the desert. In our own lives, renew our hope. Help us to look to you to remember the tomb is empty and you are alive, seeking to pull us out of the pit and the circumstances as we look to you and hold up our arms. And even then, if our arms grow weary, Lord, weary, Lord, you send help to us. Lord, as we join back together with our messy families and difficult relationships to celebrate Easter, Lord, allow us to share your love and hope, to let go of our past, to open our arms as you did, to show mercy, kindness, gentleness, and love to those struggling around us. Let us extend that scarlet rope of hope, this hope that your word says in Hebrews is the hope that we have as an anchor for the soul. And we want that too for our loved ones. Thank you that you are the Lamb of God, and in you we are saved from destruction. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Ladies, I do want to say, if you're here in need of hope today, not just the hope of eternity, but hope for today, for this minute, please don't leave here without talking to someone, praying with someone, whether it's your marriage, your children, health, finances, maybe you're brokenhearted, we want to pray with you. And I would say... Isn't it exciting? He's alive! <laughs>